Hello and thank you for joining us on Sideline Story, your destination for sports news, analysis and discussions. I'm Brandon Yates. The United Nations COP28 climate conference is ongoing in Dubai, so today we will be discussing climate change's potential impacts on sports. We'll chat about what some of the effects of climate change could be, what is being done to prevent these effects from occurring, and which sports and nations are leading the way in terms of reducing their negative impact on the environment. I'll be getting into all of these talking points with my two fantastic co-hosts, Fuyu and Tianyu. And Fuyu, of course, over the last week or so, um, with COP28 ongoing and the climate change conversation, I would say has been a hot topic in the last week or so. With that in mind, and of course, we are focusing on sports, um, sure. would you say there's been an effect that climate change has had on sports and potentially vice versa? Sure. Um, actually, according to a United Nations report, sport is both a contributor and a casualty of climate change, uh, which I think is easy to understand because when there's extreme weather, like um, what we've experienced this year, yeah. in summer it was like 40 degrees in Celsius. My and first day in Beijing, <laughs> <laughs> just coming from South Africa, which I thought was a pretty warm country, the day that I arrived Pants. here it was 40 degrees Celsius. <laughs> I couldn't Pants. believe, I thought I was melting. <laughs> yeah, uh, I believe that will make your experience in China very <laughs> memorable. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, so like in uh, high temperatures or uh, the weather that we've been having these days uh, where the lowest dips to below zero, of mm. course, there are a lot of outdoor activities that are not suitable anymore. So um, yeah, that's a, one aspect of the effect of climate change on sport. And also it uh, affects professional competitions as well. Um, I think it was earlier this year, more than uh, nearly 200 athletes uh, signed a letter addressed to the International Snow Ski and Snowboard Federation uh, demanding action on climate change. Yeah. So these are professional athletes. Um, and if they are writing that letter, uh, which shows that global warming is threatening their job and their livelihood, mm. it really underlines the urgency of addressing climate change. And yeah. uh, I think it, it should also raise our awareness and uh, prompt us to think about what we can do as individuals. It could have an impact on, yeah, yeah. It could have a future um, impact on their sport as well. I've seen a couple of videos online where multiple, um, like you said, particularly winter sport athletes are very concerned about the effects that climate change are having on a variety of winter sports. And it seems like globally there is a reduced amount of snowfall yes. happening on a yearly basis yes, a and the winter seasons for a variety of sports is getting shorter and shorter. Yes, because winter has been getting uh, shorter and uh, this snow season a lot of ski resorts in Europe have been struggling because there simply isn't sufficient snow yeah. or if uh, uh, like winter is too short. And I guess it also has a major impact just on you know fans of winter sports. It doesn't necessarily um, only affect the professional athletes but you know, people that enjoy winter sports in terms of a leisure activity. And then again, it probably also has a massive impact on the tourism industry as well, because I think it's something like over 40 million Americans um, that are non-professional athletes enjoy winter sports and they travel to, you know, these uh, winter locations and, and they use winter accommodation and that kind of thing. So it's, it's a thriving business just in that nation alone. And that doesn't even include Europe and Asia and, mm -hmm. and places like that. So it could have a huge impact on that industry as well. Yes, and it's also not good news for the winter sports industry in China, which is only getting started after the Beijing Winter Olympic Games. Yeah, yeah. A lot of Chinese people are catching up to skiing or snowboarding. So yeah, they, there's really um, it's really important for us to start thinking about what we can do to mitigate that problem. Absolutely, and we'll get into that talking point soon. But Tianyu, what are your thoughts on this matter? Well, uh, I've never thought of talking about climate change on a sports podcast, and now, <laughs> and now we are. But we've, as, as we've seen already in this yeah. early discussion, it clearly does have a massive impact on sports, yeah. and we've just spoken about winter sports. We'll get into summer sports soon, mm -hmm. but um, it clearly is something that we should be focusing on. Yeah, and, and after doing some research on that, it's quite a surprise for me to find out that uh, actually there are a lot of sports that are being 
affected by climate change. You know, uh, Fuyu just touched on uh, some of the winter sports that are affected by climate change. And I think, um, you know, this year is ex widely deemed as the hottest year ever on record. And tennis players are actually suffering the most from yes. the extreme heat. And it was in 2018 when the uh, professional tennis players st first started to complain about rising temperatures during the U.S. Open in New York City, which mm. took place in a hot August summer. Mm. And during that tournament, Novak Djokovic struggled badly with the scorching weather during his match with uh, a Hungarian player. And apart from Djokovic, four other players had to retire during, uh, due to the extreme heat. And since then, the Australian Open and the U.S. Open have implemented heat uh, rules to mm. help protect players. Mm. It's happened in a variety of sports yeah. too. I mean, I think of uh, football and rugby yeah. as well. Um, previously, the only times that those athletes would be able to grab a drink or, you know, um, take some sort of hydration mm. in or grab a snack or something like that would be at halftime. Mm. But now if um, a particular match is being played in really um, high temperatures, mm -hmm. they'll normally have a water break before halftime. It normally happens, you know, at the 15 or 20 minute mark. I've mm. noticed that in rugby in particular, which is crazy because rugby is predominantly a winter sport. <laughs> And it seems like the conditions that rugby players are finding themselves in is also getting hotter and hotter by the, you know, every single year. Yeah, and, of, and also cricket, you know, in, in twenty Your favorite sport. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Ashes, when the Ashes tournament was held, England captain Joe Root mm. was taken to hospital during the Jeez. fifth test between England and Australia. Yeah. And that day, the temperature in the middle of the Sydney cricket grounds reached 57 degrees wow. Celsius. It's like... To be oh. fair though, I mean, Australia is known as a very hot country and obviously yeah. the UK is generally pretty cold. So it yeah. makes sense that UK athletes would struggle in Australia when the temperatures reach those yeah. incredible levels. Yeah, I just can't imagine playing in such high temperatures. Yeah. It was like playing in sauna. And for such a long period of time, because yeah. a lot of those cricket matches, particularly when it's test cricket, I mean, mm. you're out there for the whole day. You're yeah. normally out there from like 8 to 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, so those are particularly challenging circumstances if the temperatures are high or low yeah. um, but whenever it's extreme temperatures a sport like cricket because of the length of time that you know is required to play mm -hmm. that sport that becomes very difficult for all involved the umpires the, the athletes the yeah. coaches etc yeah and also football you know the, yeah the organizers of the world uh, Qatar World Cup mm. had to turn a normally summer event into a winter <laughs> event to avoid the worst of the region's steamy heat. Well, you would not yeah. want to play a winter sport in summer in the desert. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, even as it was held in winter, the game was still played in stadiums that are air conditioned yes. to, to keep the temperature at around 26 degrees Celsius. <laughs> nice and freezing at 26 degrees yeah. Celsius. Yeah, so. But at yeah. least it made. Um, the game's more manageable for the mm. players, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, extreme heat has been posing a big threat to sports. And, and, and apart from that, uh, poor air quality is yes. another problem that is posing a threat. We know air pollution can decrease you know, lung function and uh, reduce blood flow, mm. which are extremely important for athletes when they're training or competing. Yeah, and those and, are just short-term uh, effects. I mean, if mm. you think of long-term effects of pollution on yeah. people that are very physically active outside, that can also be very Health detrimental for, for not just um, professional athletes, but mm. just for people that enjoy yeah. mm. partaking Definitely. in leisure activities that in yeah. involve physical activity outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to put into perspective how pollution and climate change are related, uh, usually when it's colder, mm -hmm. uh, the pollution is worse because mm -hmm. cold air uh, traps the particles. Of course. Yeah, a lot of races have been cancelled because of uh, increases, increases in wildfire, smoke, and poorer air quality. Like running races, you mean? Yeah. yeah. In, in 2018, a wildfire smoke from the campfire caused the Berkeley Half Marathon to be cancelled because of unhealthy air quality levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, research results show that uh, carbon monoxide and fine particulates in the air could reduce baseball umpires ability to get calls right. That's mm. what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. the, the, the poor weather is affecting also the referee's decision-making yeah, probably ability. Yeah, because it probably affects their mental state. Yeah. And if it gets particularly bad, I mean, I suppose visibility can also become an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So there's various ways that that can also have an effect. And mm. just with uh, another example that I'm thinking of with regards to the effects that heat have on certain athletes, I think it was 
It was definitely this year. I don't remember which particular tennis event it was. It was one of those traditionally hot events. So it was either the US Open or the Australian Open. It might have been the US Open, but I remember Daniil Medvedev went up to a camera and grabbed it and like was seemingly speaking to the organizers and said, I'm dying out here. Like I literally, I'm, I'm sweating, I can't breathe. So he was, he, he, he looked desperate almost. Mm. Um, and, and he was, I think, having a relatively easy time in his match. He was, mm. it looked like he was definitely going to win. So it wasn't the, the match that was causing the problem. It was just the conditions that he and his opponent were facing. And he just, it was like a cry for help. It was, it, you know, I, I guess he was joking in a sense, but just from his, his tone and his facial expressions, he looked really desperate. So hopefully we you know, don't see circumstances like that in the future. Because like you said, with someone like Joe Root, it ended up with him having to go to hospital. And we don't want to see athletes well, going to hospital ever. But we definitely don't want to see them going to hospital as a result of the conditions that they're playing in. That seems ludicrous to me. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, we've, we've focused on professional athletes predominantly at this point. But for you, um, you know, I guess every now and again, you would probably take part in outdoor sports activities or, you know, just, you know, get involved in that sort of thing, whether it be outdoors or indoors, you know, yeah. physical activity, sports, you know, trying to stay in shape. Have you personally experienced any instances that, you know, have affected you that are linked to climate change? Yes, uh, I've noticed that summers are getting hotter and winters <laughs> are becoming colder. Yep. Yeah, um, I think for me personally, uh, the biggest change that's happened for me is uh, I've been forced to move my sports activities indoors, if you call that sports activities. And I'll get into that. One example um, is that earlier this year, before it got warm, um, I decided to go for a run at Shougang Park, which mm -hmm. is the headquarters of the Beijing Winter Olympics yeah. uh, committee, organizing committee. And, and the, also the FIS World Cup is happening there right yes, now, I think, right? Yeah. Yes, and also one of the venues uh, the, for the big air competitions. Of course. Yeah. Um, is that where Eileen Gu made a name for herself, right? Yeah, that's yes. where she became like a yeah, global sensation. That's where she competed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it was after I finished a morning shift. I usually go take a nap and I decided that on that day that I would go for a run after I, w I wake up. Um, but when I woke up, uh, because it was cold, like I said, cold air uh, tends to become stagnant. Right. So it's not really uh it doesn't create conditions for the pollution to disperse and when i woke up the pollution was like over 500 it was very bad wow. yeah so that that's uh i think it was the first time that prompted me to think uh if the uh, climate affects me that much what can i do if i should change my routine if i should take up other sports so um Right now, I've switched to doing yoga and some home workout programs. Nice. And uh, there's also, indoors. I mean, there's also ways to run indoors as well. I guess treadmill running is an option. Yeah, yeah. And uh, also, if you go to a gym, rather than buying all the sports gears, I mm. think that also reduces carbon, em helps reduce carbon emissions. Right, right. And um, for me, as well as other people, uh, there's also health issues that we need to take into consideration. Of course, in extreme heat or cold, uh, there's the risk of dehydration yeah. or um, cardiovascular and respiratory pro problems. So it might not be suitable for everyone to run or play ball games outdoors. Even mm. if you are healthy and uh, there are no health conditions whatsoever, it's, I don't think it's worth the risk to carry out those activities yeah. in um, non-ideal weather conditions. Right, right. I mean, we'll get into potential solutions and what's being done to combat that soon. But the kind of theme that I'm hearing right now is that it seems like a lot of the solutions to the problems that professional athletes and just the general public are facing in terms of physical activity outdoors is to move things indoors. Is that the future of sport and physical education and just physical activity? Will we be moving traditionally outdoor activities indoors? Of course, ideally the outdoor activities should stay outdoors, but I think it could be one solution. Like uh, if there's no, not enough snow, there's man-made snow. Yeah. Mm. And uh, for some of the activities, uh, for some of the sports, 
tennis can move indoors. Yeah, um, I guess any sport can kind of move indoors. I can't really think of a sport that you have to play outdoors. Um, but we, we'll get into those potential <laughs> solutions soon. But Tianyu, um, just staying with the topic of personal experience mm. um, linked to climate change and physical activity, have you had any um, experiences yourself in that regard? Yes, of course I had. You know, as a football lover, one of my <laughs> routines... Which position do you play? Tell me. Forward, of yes, course. Yes, of forward. course. <laughs> <laughs> I love scoring. Yeah. And one of my routines in summer vacations, my student days, was, you know, just calling up a few of my best buddies and mm. heading for the playground in my high school and just playing football for the whole afternoon. And uh, I, uh, in southern China, the sun could really be scorching. But at that time, we just seems like we just don't feel it. Yeah. <laughs> That's another interesting thing, you know. Uh, we'll, we'll get back into what you were saying shortly. Mm. But I remember I was having a conversation with my mother a couple of uh, years ago. And she, we were talking about the sun and sunblock and that kind of thing. And she said, you know, when I was a kid, um, yeah. even in the, the middle of summer, like 30 degrees outside, you could go to the beach all day, not wear sunblock and not get sunburned. It's yeah. crazy how things have changed now where if you go outside and it's, you know, it's a sunny day and above 30 degrees Celsius, if you are not wearing sun protection, you'll probably get sunburned after like five minutes. Maybe my body just is not as good as before. <laughs> young, having a younger body is Yeah, no, but it's just, it's, it's just an example like, you know, of how different things were, you know, mm. 30, 40, 50 years ago, yeah. but even now, how quickly the situation seems to be Changing. worsening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, yeah, yeah like, like, like I said, uh, I could be playing football for a whole afternoon in yeah. summer, in hot summer, but now things are totally different. Like, this year, you know, just walking out of my house would be a torture for me. I, yeah. can't, I just can't live or move without the air condition. Yeah, yeah. And in summer, I mean, I couldn't step outside without an umbrella. Yeah. Like it's actually, <laughs> and, and, and it seems like yeah. that is the norm in Beijing now. Yeah, it said that this year's summer is the, has proved to be the hottest one on record. And uh, many people were getting sick due to the rising temperatures. And if, if we can't endure the heat problems, neither can the professional athletes who are who have to play in, in, in extreme heat. Mm. Yeah, so, because, you know, heat stress can cause a lot of problems to mm. a human body, such as muscle cramps, like dehydration, thirst, and fatigue. And as athletes performing these conditions, they, they could feel chills and had, like, nervous, sis, nervous system problems and yeah, yeah, yeah. affect coordination and deci decision making. So, mm. yeah, it is really a big issue and affecting everyone who are uh, when doing sports activities. So from your personal side of things, would you say that the change in climate has affected your willingness to partake in outdoor activities? Yes, of course. And also partly because I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> My body right. is not as good as before. But I mean, like, if, if you had to make a choice now, let's say, for example, you did want to play football with your buddies tomorrow, or, yeah. well, I, now's not a great example because it's the middle <laughs> of winter, so you probably wouldn't be yeah. doing too much outdoors. But let's say on a regular sort of summer's day where, you know, outdoor activity is kind of encouraged, would you be more inclined to partake in some sort of activity that is available indoors as opposed to doing something outdoors? And is that linked to climate change in some way? Like, yeah. is, has, it, has the change in climate from when you were a kid to now affected your decisions in where you will yeah, take yeah. part in your physical activities. Of course, it had, uh, it had a part to, to play because, you know, when I was a kid, like playing outdoor would be, is like nothing to... Uh, it didn't know. require yeah. consideration, right? You yeah, were just it like, just, it's a yeah, nice day, just, let's go play outside. Yeah, it's just natural to, yeah. to play outside, to call up a few bodies and just, yeah. you know, hang out and it's just to, just to breathe in some fresh air. But, mm. but now, you know, uh, in, uh, it's particularly in Beijing's like uh, days of uh, when the air quality is not good as yeah. often happens. And so. there just seems to be a global issue where there seems to be less days of mild weather. Yeah. So it's normally, you know, particularly in, I suppose, developed first world cities in Asia, Europe, the United States, etc. There seems to be a lot more extreme winters, extreme summers yeah. and not so many days where it's just a pleasant afternoon or morning or whatever it may be. It's, yeah. It seems like you need to make plans in terms of how you allocate your time and your days, right? Yeah, it seems like spring and autumn are getting 
shorter yeah, and shorter. Exactly what and, I wanted and to winter say. Winter and yeah. summer are getting. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Like, do you think we have less mild days than we did in the past? Like, we, yeah. we have to prepare. We have to take the weather conditions into consideration more than we have done in the past. Definitely, at the turn of seasons, like you can go from wearing thick down jackets to wear short sleeves the next day. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there is no transition. It can happen. Yeah. And I've experienced that. Um, this year, I think it's improved a little bit because we've had autumn. Mm. Um, and True. Yeah, r um, right now you can still say it's late autumn, maybe not <laughs> full winter <laughs> yet. But That's scary to think of because I'm wearing <laughs> five layers to work every single day. <laughs> so I might have to end up, you know, wearing my whole wardrobe to work when it gets to full winter. <laughs> yeah, and also these days, uh, I think this winter it's becoming uh, a lot more windier than yes. in previous years. And that's I the killer. Jeez, oh, you know, it'll be a cold day and then you can kind of prepare for that. But as soon as that wind picks up, I, no matter how many yeah. layers you're yeah. wearing, it just goes right through you. Wind makes it five times colder. I would have to agree with you, absolutely. <laughs> At least five times, yeah. But with all of these factors in mind, and we've seen the effects that climate change and the extreme weather conditions is ha having on professional athletes, on just the general public, it's something that I guess sporting organizations are taking note of, um, finally, and hopefully they are doing something to counter that, not just to protect their sports and their athletes, but to benefit um, the environment and you know, society as a whole. Can you think of any sporting organizations that are making serious efforts to counter the problems that we are facing and that we could potentially face in the future if nothing is done? Yes, I think the example that's closest to us is definitely the Beijing Winter Olympic Games. The organizing committee made early pledges that uh, they will host a low carbon or even carbon neutral Winter Olympic Games. And shame Yang Guang's not here today because he <laughs> covered the event. I'm sure he would have a, a lot to share with us about yeah. what he saw um, about some of the low carbon practices. But uh, right now what I can think of um, is the use of renewable energies, uh, like the Olympic torch was powered by hydrogen, and also some of the, actually most of the service vehicles, I think uh, more than 80% of those vehicles were powered by either hydrogen or electricity. Wow. And also the uh, low carbon venues, all of the venues ran on 100% clean energy. So that definitely helped Beijing 2022 to overachieve its carbon goals. It seemed like that event was kind of a groundbreaker in the sense that it was probably the first sporting event that I can think of that made such efforts to reduce their carbon footprints. I can't think of any other sporting event before then that made such great efforts to achieve that, but also actually achieved it and even surpassed their goals, right? Yeah, and it's amazing how renewable energy was so widely used throughout the event. Mm. I think that will set an example or at least demonstrate that uh, clean energy is the way to go and it has the uh, capacity to power such a big major event. So I think all sports activities or future competitions can follow that example. Absolutely. Tianyu, any other examples you can think of? Well, the, yeah, the International Olympic Committee has, first of all, has developed a sustainability strategy and they aim to move beyond carbon neutrality and make the games carbon negative by mm. 2030. So what I'm hearing right now is that it seems like the Olympics mm -hmm. seem to be making the greatest splash in yeah. terms of reducing a carbon footprint, which yeah. is probably a great place to start because I think besides yeah, football, it's, it's the most widely um, known yeah. about and watched sport. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, not sport, I mean sporting event because yeah. obviously it's multiple sports. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the commitment to climate action is now one of the requirements to, for Canada cities to host the Olympic Games. And in the recent uh, Tokyo Olympic Games, 60% of all the facilities of the tournament were from pre-existing buildings. Mm. Yeah, and a lot of games and facilities for the tournament were powered by renewable energy. Mm. Yeah, and similarly, the in China we held the uh, Chengdu World University Games this yeah. summer, and which you managed yeah. to cover, right? Yeah. yeah, and the majority of the facilities were based on existing ones, mm. and uh, many of them 
were renovated with green materials. Yes, I that's another. That's yeah, <laughs> sorry, that's another key point, right? Is yeah. um, reusable facilities. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, that's and repurposing also, them. That's also a trend that began with Beijing 2022. Yes, yeah, absolutely. A lot, a lot, a lot of the venues for the Winter Games were repurposed from mm. existing ones. Yeah, and a lot of them were from the 2008 Summer Games as well, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of these facilities now are now open to public. Mm. For, yes. Yeah. Mm. For yeah. Because that's been an issue in the past, I think. When I think of, um, for example, South Africa and the FIFA World Cup in 2010, there was an issue um, after that event where we, you know, we built these fantastic stadiums, world-class venues, and then a lot of them just kind of sat empty for quite a long time. I think it also happened in Rio after their Olympic Games. It's since then uh, uh, improved. I mean, there's been a lot more efforts from professional sports teams in South Africa to make use of those new venues. Um, but I think that is an issue that is being tackled globally is that, you know, it's great that you're producing these world class facilities, but they need to be sustained and used on a regular basis to to make sense. Mm. Yeah. And even if they don't open the venues to the public, maintenance is costly. Yeah. So might as well put that into use for the public and probably generate some revenue as well. Mm. I, I think the more use that these world-class venues get, the better, absolutely. But for you, we, we've talked about the Olympics and what they're doing to you know, reduce their carbon footprint. Are there any other sports in particular that have a large carbon footprint and are making efforts to reduce that? Yeah, I think generally the sports that have the largest viewership yeah. are the biggest polluting sports, right. uh, for example, football. And um, actually one practice to reduce football's carbon footprint wasn't born um, voluntarily. It was uh, born out of special circumstances. The Chinese Super League during the pandemic was uh, the, the games were played in two competition zones. You can say played in two bubbles. Oh, and right, as opposed to using multiple venues and yes. multiple cities. So it yes, probably reduced travel needs. Yeah, yeah. because regularly uh, football, also basketball, play uh, home and away. Yeah, and all, all sports, I suppose. Yeah, for, yeah. Uh, for other sports like Formula One and the ocean race, in sailing, um, they are they have a global calendar, so mm. there is also a lot of travel involved. Um, and uh, my example that the Chinese Super League played in two competition zones during the pandemic and limited audience numbers, um, I think that greatly reduced emissions because there was less or no traveling. Mm. But as uh, football returns to its normal form after the pandemic, I don't think it'll be fair to take that experience away from the fans yeah. to stop them from coming to the stadiums. It's a difficult circumstance to manage, right? Mm. Because you obviously want to be as environmentally friendly as possible, but you also want to make all of the fans happy and give each set of fans a fair chance to see their team play yeah. at home. Yes, and thanks to the evolution um, or the development of technologies, a lot of the um, aviation fuel have been using renewable energy in the blend. I mean, not completely renewable energy, but uh, renewable energy is taking a bigger share yeah. in aviation fuel. And actually just a few days, just this week, um, Virgin Atlantic completed a flight from London to New York on 100% renewable, sustainable energy. Wow. And that was the first long haul commercial flight to achieve that. That's so fantastic. that definitely gives us hope um, about yeah. the future of the aviation industry. And if we can solve that problem, of course, um, the the reduced carbon emissions will have a positive impact on sporting events as well. Absolutely. Tianyu, from your side, any sports that are, you know, making yeah. efforts to reduce the uh, yeah. carbon footprint? Yeah, I'm going to stick to football. Of course, the, glo <laughs> yeah. the global game. Yeah. We should focus on them. Because, yeah. yeah, the data shows that uh, the 2022 Qatar World Cup has generated an estimated 3.6 million tons of CO2. Wow. And of which 95% are indirect emissions mainly from travel and accommodation. Mm. And uh, yeah, and other football tournaments like the Premier League and the uh, UEFA Champions League are also releasing large amounts of carbon emissions. Through the and, same means, right? Through accommodation yeah, and travel. Yeah, yeah. And, and many of these clubs are already taking action to reduce their emissions. You know, Manchester City and Arsenal are, are investing in carbon reduction initiatives, including switching to renewable energy and uh, installing Aut automated LED lighting on club sites and yeah. also 
In China, organizers of the Chinese Football Federation are encouraging fans and spectators to <coughs> recycle their waste mm. and uh, save drinking water after football matches. Yeah, well, that's yeah. fantastic. And I think we have to keep this climate change conversation going. And hopefully it is a conversation that continues, particularly when it comes to big industries, you know, like sport, um, travel, accommodation. I think it's very important. And I think that if we continue to make efforts to reduce our carbon footprint globally, then hopefully sports can kind of stay the way that they are and we can enjoy it for years to come, especially when it comes to home and away games and those sorts of things. But that is all we have time for on this week's episode of Sideline Story. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, we will be back next week with our latest topic and we'll see you then. This is CGTN Radio. Hear the difference.